All right. So thanks for joining me. I'm going to be talking about higher kinded data today. Let's dive in. So who am I? I'm Chris Penner. Uh, I actually write Golang to pay the bills and I really like it, uh, but I do a lot of Haskell on the side, just as hobby projects. Uh, I also like doing handstands. Uh, I wrote the book Optics by Example. If you're at all interested in lenses and optics and stuff like that, you can go check that out. Uh, I've also got a blog at uh, chrispenner.ca. Sweet. So what are we talking about today? Let's start with the basics. Okay. So I'm going to be doing this talk in Haskell. Uh, and I'm going to be using, you know, kind of Haskell idioms and Haskell syntax. Uh, but you can actually apply this sort of concept to most languages which use, uh, which have a concept of higher kind of types. So feel free to make that translation uh, into your language of choice. So let's start off with a data type representing a GitHub repository. Okay, so here's our type. It's a regular Haskell record. I'm saying that I have a repository and that that repository has three fields. So those three fields, we've got a name, which is just a string representing the name of the repository. The owner is a custom data type, uh, which is just an email. And we've got the number of stars that that GitHub repository has. So pretty standard stuff, nothing too special there. Uh, really, really standard form for this data. It's how most people would model it, I think. But we have to recognize data isn't always perfect, right? Uh, the fields, you know, certain fields might be missing from a chunk of data. Uh, certain fields might be invalid, uh, depending on where that data came from. We have to understand that data takes a journey when it enters our system, right? Maybe we're reading from a file. Maybe it's user input that needs to be validated. Maybe it's coming from a web form, you know? Um, data doesn't typically just exist out in the world. It has to get into our system somehow. And so we have all of these different variants that we can think of where, you know, data is coming from all of these different places, all of these different data sources, and we have to represent that that data might not yet be validated. Uh, so how can we represent all of these different data variants in a well-typed way and get them into our system? Well, uh, one way would be one record per kind of use case or like per, per uh, type that's coming in. So here is our kind of standard gold standard uh, data form here. This is what we ideally would have all the time, but uh, we also have this here. It's a partial repository and it represents, you know, when data is uh, potentially incomplete, right? So we can say we have uh, the name was maybe specified and the owner was maybe specified and the stars maybe exist, right? Uh, but we might also have this idea of a validated repository. So we got some user input, we validated it, and then maybe not all of the fields actually were considered valid. So maybe the name had invalid characters or was too long, uh, or the owner wasn't a proper email address, or maybe we had negative stars or something, right? So we can represent, um, you know, potentially failed uh, validation using a record like this, okay? So... What's the problem with this? Well, there's a lot of boilerplate here, right? So for each of these potential use cases, for each of these ways that data might be flawed, we have to write a whole new type. And for that new type, we have to duplicate all of the instances for it. So all the from JSON instances, all the to JSON instances, any pretty printers and any utilities that operate on that type, we pretty much have to duplicate, copy paste all of those. Uh, we also need to keep all of these records in sync, right? So if we add a new field to the repository, we also need to add it to the validated repository and to the, you know, partial repository. And we need to update all of those functions to handle those new fields as well. And, you know, uh, one of, this is probably one of the bigger ones is we have no structured relationship between these fields. So there's actually no inherent connection between the name of the, like, standard uh, repository record to the partial repository record. Like they might both have the same field name, um, but there's no actual connection that GHC or Haskell can do anything with. So what's our end goal here? Well, ideally, uh, a lot less boilerplate, right? We don't want to handle all of that stuff ourselves. We would love to have a single shared structure that we can use for each of these use cases so that we're not um, creating new records every single time we need something new. And we want this structured relationship between fields of related types so that GHC or Haskell can kind of uh, connect 
related fields in these different data variants together so that we know that like a partial name is actually somehow related to the name of our kind of gold standard record there. Okay, so how can we get there? What are we gonna do? Well, let's step back a little bit and take a look at polymorphic records first because the patterns we're gonna be using are very similar to this uh, with just a couple small changes. So here is what a polymorphic record looks like in Haskell. Um, when I say polymorphic record, I mean a data type with a type variable here. Uh, and this type variable can change. It can take on any type, right? It's just a type parameter. So this is equivalent to uh, like generics in Java. Uh, most other languages have some sort of way to represent this idea. And here I'm defining a generic stock keeping unit. So this allows us to keep track of how many of a given item we have in, um, you know, maybe in our warehouse or something like that. So we can keep track of any type of item and we can keep track of how many units of that item we have, okay? Now, the cool thing about these polymorphic records, right? Uh, we can fill in that A for whatever we want. So I'm gonna define a new type for DVD here, and we can keep track of how many uh, units of the Terminator DVD we have by just you know putting DVD in this A slot, and that means anywhere in the structure that we had an A is now going to be a DVD, so we can put a DVD in this item slot as well, right? Uh, and we can just use regular uh, Haskell record syntax for that. Pretty cool. But we can also use it for something else, right? So we kept track of our Terminator stock here. We can also define a, a candy new type, and we can say, okay, like how many Milka bars do we have? Uh, and we can use the exact same record for that. We're just changing this type parameter, right? And these records are clearly related in some way. They have the same fields, they have the same type, they have the same constructor, but this field has changed type because we specialized the polymorphic part, okay? So that's a really key pattern. Can we see any sort of similar pattern here, right? So all of these fields across these different variants are very similar. Um, but unlike the stock keeping one where, you know, a single field was changing values, something here is changing across all of the fields. It's kind of across the different dimension. So here we just have the base fields and here every field we can see is wrapped in this maybe wrapper. Okay. And for the validated repository, every field is wrapped in either error. Right? So we are, in a sense, altering each of these fields in a specific way, uh, depending on what we want to do with our record. So we can see it's actually the same sort of record, the same structure, but every variant has a different field wrapper that's applied. So can we use this data type polymorphism to be polymorphic over this wrapper? Well, of course we can, otherwise this would be a very short talk. So let's see how we do it. So I'm defining a data type, just like I did the stock keeping unit. Uh, we're gonna call this our repository HKD, that stands for higher kinded data type. I'll explain what that exactly means in just a second here. And we take a type parameter. So remember, a type parameter can vary. So in this case, F could be any wrapper type, okay? Uh, and I'm using F here just because typically we use that to represent functor-ish things in, in Haskell. Uh, it's just an idiom. You can use any letter or phrase you want. Um, and for our first field, well, we're going to say it's a string. We know that the base important type here is a string, but we can wrap that string in any polymorphic wrapper. Okay. And we can see for owner, we have the email. This is still the same type and it's wrapped in something and stars is an integer that's wrapped in something, okay? So we've defined effectively the exact same type, but we've inserted this polymorphic F here, uh, and we've done it on every single field, okay? So hopefully following so far. Uh, and this is, this gives us the definition of what I'm gonna call a higher kind of data type, okay? So uh, if we check the kind, so the kind in Haskell is the type of a type, uh, effectively, so we're, we're checking the kind of our record and we can see it takes as a type parameter, a variable, this F, and this F has the type, uh, sorry, the kind, 
type to type, meaning it takes an argument for it to be fully applied, okay? And that's gonna be the field type, like a wrapper has to wrap something, and that's what this is saying, okay? Uh, and this gives us the higher kinded data type structure, anything that matches this pattern, okay? So an HKD is a type with this kind, so any sort of data type that takes a wrapper and applies it to all the fields. Great. So let's compare um, what we can do with this. So let's see here. So here's our polymorphic uh, repository higher kind of data type. And we can substitute that F for different things. So on the right here, this is not valid Haskell syntax. I'm just demonstrating what happens if we set F to be maybe well, the record that results is going to have maybe wrapping every field, right? This is effectively our partial uh, variant, okay? Now, let's look at what that is with actual record syntax. So here we can create a value, which is a partial repository, simply by saying, I want to choose the maybe wrapper for our repository higher kind of data type. Now that means that maybe is gonna wrap every field. So when we define those fields, we say, okay, name is gonna be just this name. And we can put nothing in one of these fields because nothing is a valid maybe type. And stars is just 14. Now you'll notice, right, the underlying type is still preserved. So stars is a maybe int and name is a maybe string. Owner will be a maybe email. That is still type checked, uh, which is pretty cool. We're only varying on the wrapper. Okay, so what about kind of our uh, gold standard unwrapped repository fields? How can we reclaim this, right? Because we've said, okay, this is where we want to end up. But uh, of course, this type, can we use it for this when we've said every single field must be wrapped in some F? Well, what, do we, uh, what can we use for F to get this? So in order to do that, we need a wrapper, which doesn't actually do anything, right? We just want the underlying fields uh, to propagate fully and that exist in Haskell in base uh, and most languages with higher kind of types. We'll have some equivalent for this. Uh, this is called the identity functor here. And it literally just, it, if we, it's a wrapper around A where all it is is a wrapper around A. Uh, and so any type will just live inside there and it doesn't actually do anything. It just provides an empty wrapper. So uh, here's what this looks like if we have kind of our gold standard record form. If we say we have identity here, we can just put the field values in here and notice we are guaranteed. We must actually specify every field uh, because identity doesn't have like a nothing constructor like maybe does, we have to have every field. So it is a little bit annoying that we have this wrapper here. Uh, there are ways around that. I'm not gonna get into them in this talk, uh, but you can go check them out uh, online later. Okay, so that's uh, a lot of talk about kind of how we can define these types. Uh, let's look at an example of where we might actually want to do that. So I'm gonna talk about REST APIs. Uh, hopefully you're at least uh, somewhat familiar with REST APIs. We're gonna talk about uh, REST API for our repository. So I'm gonna talk about the patch endpoint. And when you patch a resource in REST, it allows you to effectively update any subset of fields for that resource, right? So let's say I wanna update this repository and I only want to update the name of that repository. So I want to change the name of my repository from whatever it is to something else. Uh, well, I would have to submit a JSON kind of post body to do that. And I would probably, uh, according to the kind of patch standard for REST endpoints, I would just specify the thing that I want to change, which would be the name. Now, when on the Haskell side, on the server side, we want to deserialize that request, well, we need a, a data type to store what we parse from that JSON, right? Uh, and, you know, first instinct would be to use our repository type, but what happens? Well, when we deserialize it, what do we put in the owner and the stars if those aren't specified? Right? Well, we, we could of course like put in some zero value, like zero stars or like an empty email or something, but there's a couple problems with that. Like is an empty email even constructible? Can we even represent that? 
and even if we did, well, how is that different from them specifying that they do want to change the email, they want to set it to the empty email, right? So we can't really use Sentinel values here because uh, it's just not strongly typed, it's not always possible, and it sometimes has multiple meanings, so it, it leads to ambiguity. Well, what we can do, of course, if we receive a post body like this, where we say, oh, I just want to update the name, uh, well, we can make a partial record with our higher kind of data type using maybe. And this is easy because now it gives us the ability to express, oh, they didn't update the owner or the stars. Those were not present, they were, they were missing, but we do want to update the name, right? And this gives us that extra little bit that uh, helps us do this in a valid way. Cool. Okay, so we've seen a lot with maybe. Uh, I've kind of been using that to establish our, our baseline. Uh, and it, when we use maybe as a wrapper, it represents these kind of partial records or records with a subset of their possible fields. But we've got lots of other wrappers. Let's look at what some other types of wrappers can give to us. Uh, so one other wrapper type we can use is a list. So this is the list constructor. Uh, and if we use a list to wrap every field in our structure, what do we get? We have a record where each field has zero or more values, okay? So maybe with zero or one, list gives us zero or more. Uh, so we're gonna look at a new data type now. I'm gonna define a web server config, higher kind of data type. And what I mean by web server config is, it's just um, a configuration that a user could specify when they're running some web server. Uh, and for instance, in our case, we are going to allow them to specify which port they want to run that web server on. Okay, so the port is just going to be an integer and you can see we have wrapped it in this uh, polymorphic wrapper type just like we did before. We've got a file path to some other preferences that they might have for whatever this web server is. And we allow them to specify kind of a, a URL for the database that they want to connect to. Okay, so we just got a basic config where they can specify a couple, a handful of things. Okay, so if we put a list in that wrapper type, what do we get? Well, for our port, we can now specify a list of ports. So this was really handy, for instance, for a configuration where we want to provide defaults with fallbacks, right? So uh, we can say, okay, try running it on 8080, but because that's a pretty common port, if that fails, you can fall back to 4200, right? Um, we can also say, okay, for the preferences, check in my local directory, see if I have a preferences file. If I don't, you can go to my home directory and find it there. Um, or we can just say, okay, well, you have to use this database path, and if that's missing, you have to crash. Uh, you can also imagine we might be able to just pass an empty list and say, okay, well, I don't have a configuration for this, so use whatever your default is. Now, I want to specify this wrapper uh, where we have a list here is different than a list of web server configs. Because if you have a list of web server configs, well, if you have two web server configs in that list, you have to specify two full complete configurations. Whereas if we do it this way, you can actually vary for each field. Maybe I have two preferred ports and maybe I don't have a preferred database path. I want you to use the default. Uh, you can do that, right? They can vary in, in their numerosity. So. Um, let's look at IO. So IO is a completely different wrapper. Uh, and this is an effect in Haskell. It represents just kind of accessing the file system or the network or whatever. Uh, and if we wrap each individual field in IO, that allows us to delay the work to compute that field until that field is actually specifically required, okay? So oftentimes when we're parsing things, let's say we wanna build up a config from environment variables or command line arguments or something, typically you'll write a parser or you'll just write that in IO and you'll parse the entire configuration and return it all at once. Uh, and so then you would have something like an IO of a web server config inside. Now this flips that around. So now we say, okay, the IO wraps each individual field rather than the entire object. What does that give us? Well. When we read the port, uh, we can actually just embed this IO directly in the field. So we can say, okay, get the port environment variable and read it into an integer. 
And we can say, okay, for the YAML file, get the first uh, command line argument. And maybe for the database path, we actually have some IO action. It reaches out over the network. It talks to some service discovery endpoint or something like that. We can embed an entire, you know, big, long, expensive computation in here, right? Cool. Now, the, the nifty thing is if we're running our server and right when we boot up, well, we need to know the port, but we don't have to worry about connecting to the database right off the bat. Rather than running this big, long, expensive computation right up front, we can pull out the preferred port IO action, just run that, get the port, and easily defer all of the rest of this stuff until later. So it's pretty nifty. Okay, here's another possible wrapper. Uh, this is const string, and this allows us to do per field documentation directly in the record syntax itself in a structured way. So if you haven't seen const before, it stands for constant. Um, it comes with Haskell base, and we can see here, this is what it looks like. It has two type variables, but it actually only contains the, the one, the first one. And the second one is what we call a phantom type variable. It does not actually exist at the value level. Now, I mentioned before, a higher kind of data type has to, the wrapper has to take exactly one argument. Okay, so this one takes two. So how does that work? Well, luckily in Haskell, currying works at the type level as well. So we can actually apply this first uh, variable and we can then have a wrapper, a curried wrapper, which takes the next argument. Okay, so uh, here is like one potential value of a const. So we can say if we have a const string, well, then we just have some text, right? And this field could be anything because it's just going to be thrown away. So this would be our wrapper here, the const string, and it takes this additional field argument, which is just thrown away. Now, because it's just thrown away, that means we can put a string into any of these fields. So if we have documentation for our web server config, we say, okay, use const string. And no matter what the type is, this one's an int, this one's a file path, whatever, we can still just put a string in there. This allows us to document each field directly in the record itself in a structured way, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's a little trick that you can use in Haskell is that const has an overloaded strings instance. So we can literally just write uh, a string in here if we turn on that extension. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this. It might be a little bit confusing, but kind of nifty. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, this one I'll just go through really quick. Um, so const string allows us to replace the type of a field with uh, a, a string for like documentation and stuff. If we use a tuple instead, rather than throwing away that second parameter, we keep it. So that means we can actually annotate real data with whatever type we want. I'm gonna use string here as an example. And this is handy for things like if you're writing, um, you know, you parsed uh, our config, um, then you can keep track of where each value came from uh, using like a source configuration or something like a source position. So pretty nifty. Uh, you can also, of course, define your own wrappers. Uh, just anything that matches that kind of type takes one type parameter. Uh, you can you can do it, and it doesn't need to be a functor. It doesn't need to be contravariant functor. It doesn't need to be covariant functor. Uh, it can be pretty much whatever you want, so long as it takes that one argument. Okay, great. So we have defined all sorts of these cool wrappers, uh, and I've shown you how to build them, and we've looked at like one example, but. Uh, what else can these things do for us? Can they save us work? How do we use these sorts of cool records? Well, we're going to keep going with this uh, configuration example, and I'm going to dive in deeper on this idea that the user of the web server config can provide a set of overrides. Okay, so this is kind of the settings that they want to apply, but we also probably have a default configuration. So if the user doesn't specify anything, uh, that it'll use all of those settings. So if we look at the wrappers here, these are all web server configs, but the defaults, I'm going to say, we're going to use identity, which means this is just a standard record and every single field must have a default. But for the overrides, they can choose to override any or none or all of those fields by specifying a subset uh, using maybe. So they can just pass nothing if they don't want to provide an override um, or just if they do. 
Okay, and then we're gonna combine those and we're gonna say use the override if it exists. And if it doesn't fall back to the default, and because we always have a fallback, we can guarantee every single field must have some value after we've run this computation. Uh, it's just some of them might be overridden and some of them not. Okay, sweet. So this is kind of a high level way of saying, if I have a default and I have some overrides, I can combine those records together and get the result. Now on a little bit more fine grained level, what is this gonna look like? Well, it doesn't really matter which field we're talking about because we don't care what the type of each configuration is. We just care about, hey, if I have a default, here's our implementation. So we've got a guaranteed default. We can just unwrap the identity and throw it away. We might have an override. I can case match on that override. And if we have one, we use it. And if not, then we fall back to the default, okay? So this works at a field level and it does not care what type of field it is. It only cares about the wrappers, which is a really interesting property that we're gonna use in just a second. So what we need to do now is we've written this field logic. It works on any field, but we want to apply it kind of across the entire configuration. How can we do that? Well, here's the, the long form way is you can literally accept each uh, the default config and the override config and for each field, go through, apply the field override to the correct fields from each one, blah, 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 blah. You can see where I'm going with this. This is a ton of boilerplate, it's a huge pain. And the problem is, is of course, if we add another field to this structure, we need to come back and edit this and update it and whatever. It's uh, just strictly a lot of work really for nothing. Um, so we wanna avoid that. So we can talk about zipping these record fields because as you can see, like this is completely just copy paste, right? Um, we can see that each field, right? We're using the same field. It's the preferred port from each one. It's the preferences YAML goes into the preferences YAML. Like we've got a lot of duplication here. Is there a way that we can factor that out? So we know that each field of the same field name has the same underlying type. It's only the wrapper that can change. And we know what the wrapper is because that's lifted into that type parameter, right? We can, we can see that. So we just need a way to line those up and run this function kind of across the fields of multiple records. So we have kind of an analog to this in base. We've got zip width. And the way zip width works, of course, it works at a value level polymorphism. So it says, okay, if we've got a list of A's and a list of B's, given a function that combines an A and a B into a C, well, I can kind of line up the matching indexes of these lists and compute the output, okay? So we wanna do the exact same thing. We wanna line up the matching fields, run a function across them and dump the result into the matching field of an output record. So I'm gonna name a, field, uh, a function here called HKD zip width. And what this does is it is zip width, but at the, uh, the wrapper level, right? It goes across fields. So we can say for any higher kind of data type, and remember that's any type that has this kind, we can take a function which is polymorphic over the field. It does not care what type of field it's running on. It only cares about the wrappers. And if it can combine the wrapper F and a field within the wrapper G and build some wrapper H, then I can apply this function across all of the possible fields and do the exact same thing. Cool, so you can see the pretty clear parallels here, right? They each take this combining function and they each take structures. It's just this one um, kind of combines the values and this one combines the wrappers. Okay, so now we can start to specialize the types of this to our specific use case. So if we start applying this to our kind of override situation, we know that F, G, and H become identity, maybe, and the result is gonna be identity. So these just slot directly in there. And then we know that we are working, in this particular case, our HKD is the web server config. So if we specialize HKD for that, we now say, oh, if you give me something that takes identity and maybe and results in identity, then I can lift that over this HKD type Perfect, well, we have this exact function that this is asking for. This is our apply field override, okay? It fits that slot perfectly. So if we put it into that slot, that by applying HKD zip width to our apply field override, we get this exact type. 
And I think we can all agree that this is a lot nicer in code review than something like this. And this automatically just handles any new field. So if we add a new field to the structure, well, it's just going to handle it. It's going to do the right thing and we don't need to worry about it. Pretty nifty. So I've talked about kind of the types for this thing, but I haven't shown you the implementation of HKD zip with, uh, and that's because it's complicated, but Luckily, we have this library that does a lot of this work for us. So there's a library on Hackage called Barbies. Uh, and what this does is, um, well, so he defines the library as types that are parametric on a functor are like Barbies that have an outfit for each role. This package provides the basic abstractions to work with them comfortably. So that's kind of a cute way to think about it. We have these types, which are parametric over their wrapper type and uh, they kind of can be applicable to many different roles. And the Barbies library is just a set of utilities for making working with those sorts of HKD types a lot easier. Okay, so what does this provide to us? Well, uh, if we keep going with this kind of zip with analogy where, okay, zip with is parametric over these values and our HKDs are parametric over these functors, uh, we can carry that kind of idea over the standard polymorphic types in base. So if we think about kind of this type in base, uh, the list type, well, it takes a single parameter and it returns a type and it implements all of these standard type classes, right? So uh, it's a functor, it's applicative, it's traversable, and each of these come with a bunch of cool utilities that are really useful. Now for higher kinded polymorphic types, they have this shape, right? This shape does not line up, meaning we cannot implement functor applicative traversable for our HKD type, right? So we can't benefit from that whole type class hierarchy. However, the Barbies library has gone ahead and given the equivalent type classes which work over wrappers instead. So we've got uh, functor B, applicative B, and traversable B. Uh, B stands for Barbies here, okay? so. These are some of the utilities that it gives us. So we have B map as opposed to F map. And if our higher kind of data type is a Barbie functor, then we can take a function which actually maps over the wrapper type and we can map over all of the wrappers in the higher kind of data type. And it provides that for us. Uh, we've can, here's an example of using it specifically with our web server config. So if we specialize all of those type parameters, we can say, okay, well, I can turn in either error of some field into a maybe of some field by just throwing away the error type. Uh, then I can convert an entire web server config with either error into an entire web server config of maybe. And it does all of that work for us. Okay. Uh, so next we have B zip with. Now this is actually the HKD zip with that I was talking about earlier, just has a, a different name. And this says, if we've got the applicative type class for our higher kind of data type, which all higher kinded records have this uh, type, um, uh, have this uh, implement this type class, then we can do the zip ring operation across all of the fields. So we can take one wrapper and another wrapper and combine them into this third wrapper and apply it across all of the fields. So that's perfect, okay. Uh, and we have this B sequence idea. So this comes from traversable B, okay? And we say if actually the wrapper type that we're using is an applicative, like we saw with IO, then I can take a higher kind of data type with a wrapper around each field, and I can actually sequence that wrapper out to the outside and get this kind of gold standard pure record on the inside. So uh, if we look at that in practice, well, we can sequence our web server config where we had an IO wrapping each field so that we could run them individually. If we decide, you know what, I just want to run them all. I want to get the full config. Then we can sequence it, get that IO to the outside and get this pure config record by just calling B sequence. So pretty cool. Lastly, we have B fold map. And this one we get uh, from traversable B as well. And this just says, if we can collapse a wrapper type with some field inside into a monoid, then we can map over all of the fields and get some monoidal summary of our structure. 
So one example thing we could do with this is we could collect all of the documentation from our record into some sort of uh, better documentation type. So as so long as this docs object here is a monoid, then we can say, oh, I've got a string documenting each field. I can map that into this documentation type. Then that documentation type is gonna get folded up and it's gonna apply that across every field. And then we get this documentation as a, as a result, pretty nifty. Okay, so how do we actually get these cool type classes? Uh, well, luckily Barbies is, it's really handy. They provide deriving strategies. So we can derive the GHC generics form of our data type. And as long as we can do that, then there are generic implementations for all of these different types. I didn't explain constraints B, that gets a little bit deeper. It allows you to actually uh, assume some constraints over the fields inside your wrapper so that you don't have to be completely polymorphic over it, uh, but that's outside the scope of this talk, but feel free to go check it out. Um, so this is all you need to do to derive and get all of those cool combinators. Okay, so what can you do with all of these nifty things that I've shown you? Um, you can handle partial serialization and deserialization for you know, JSON and derive all of those instances, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can define database DSLs and models. There's actually a few libraries out there that do this. So I think Beam Core does this, where you um, have a higher kind of data type that represents your data model, and you can provide kind of annotations for each field. You know, is this field nullable? Uh, how do I query for this field? Those sorts of things. Now you can also write like a web form library where you have an HKD that represents the kind of render into a HTML structure and it'll know how to render each form, uh, each form field. Uh, and you could also have one that parses a web form submission and turns it into uh, a more structured object or does some validation, those sorts of things. So feel free to dive into that on your own. Um, as far as other languages that can support this sort of thing, like I said, pretty much any higher kind of type library can support this. Uh, I know that people have experimented in things like Scala and TypeScript, uh, but feel free to just Google around. Uh, it's changing every day. This is a relatively new concept, so uh, there there is new work coming out in this area. Anyway, uh, so that's higher kind of data types. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Chris. Here's my blog, chrispenner.ca. I'm on GitHub, of course, and you can find me on Twitter at Chris L. Penner. And if you enjoyed this talk, uh, feel free to check out my book, uh, Optics by Example. I do a lot of um, work on lenses and optics, and this is kind of a comprehensive guide on how those work. It's written in Haskell, but of course it applies to any language that supports optics. So feel free to check that out. And I think we have some sort of question period, so I'll see you there.